here I am back in my office at Acadia University. I'm also associated with the Coastal Ecology Lab here at Acadia. So, uh, but this is mostly, uh, it was both actually. It's a, it has a collaborative uh, research project that um, began back in 2013 on the uh, Isthmus of Chinecto, which is the inner bay of Funday. Um, so Chinecto area, I um, mean Cumberland Basin area. So we're talking like Sackville, New Brunswick or Amherst, Nova Scotia, if anyone wants like a, a reference there for places. Um, so that low lying elevation, that connection piece of land between New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, most people just drive to get from point A to point B when you, when you see the Tantamar marshes. And that's where this project uh, took place. <clears throat> so it's all about uh, Gaspereau or alewife. Um, I know we're, this is the Mar <laughs> Miramichi Salmon Association and I get that. Uh, however, um, Gaspereau um, are also anadromous, like Atlantic salmon, and they're also Iterocaris, so they're, they're repeat spawners. So a lot of this, what I'm going to talk about, has application to, to salmon and salmon conservation um, for any anadromous fish, actually. So this has a lot to do with anthrop anthropogenic obstructions, whether it be dams uh, or culverts or tide gates. And so we've, since 2013, have been pit tagging um, alewife on four river systems, and I'm going to mainly concentrate on... <clears throat> on uh, three of them. However, there's four river systems that we've been focusing on in the, uh, the Chinecto Isthmus area. Um, so please, I'm not gonna jump around a little bit, but I'm gonna kind of start you at the uh, salt water, the estuary, and we're gonna work our way upstream, just like a, a spawning run Gasparo. You can, you can make yourself a salmon if you want, that's okay, but there are no Atlantic salmon populations uh, on any of these rivers that I'm aware of that are still viable or ever were. So here we go. Um, since 2013 and, and uh, even last year, we got back out in the field uh, up in the area and we've tagged over 10,000 individual Gasparo with uh, pit tags, those 23 millimeter pit tags uh, during their annual spawning runs. <clears throat> now these are not Atlantic salmon sizes, we're talking like standard uh, school classroom school ruler size, okay, like 230 millimeters fork length. Um, you know, sometimes they get up to 30 centimeters, sometimes they're just under 20. Um, in any given season that we are tracking, uh, we had uh, a maximum of nine pit uh, antenna arrays deployed everywhere from the head of tide at tide gates all the way up into the spawning lakes themselves. Uh, and so we could detect uh, any, any individual gas bro that was pit tagged either that year or, or uh, previous years, so returning fish, and I just refer to these returning fish that are tagged as returnees. Um, we tag about uh, 1,200 fish every season that we're out tagging, so about a, over a thousand fish. And so uh, after um, <clears throat> after seven spawning seasons or spawning runs that we worked tagged on, you know we're up to over 10,000 fish that have been tagged. So it's pretty impressive. A lot of data right now, and uh, so this is just what's come out of it so far. Uh, so again, we're going to start uh, in the Cumberland Basin. Picture yourself as a fish. Your spawning run just started. Uh, Gaspro run in the spring. So, and they usually start the uh, second deep tide cycle of April, give or take, depending on water temperatures and everything. But that's usually when it works. So it's usually like the mid, mid April, third week of April. That's when the Gaspro start to run in this area of Atlantic Canada. So, um, you look here at the blue square, you can see those triangles on the map, and those all represent tide gates with usually within the first five uh, kilometers of the of salt water. So we're gonna focus on uh, H, H, K, and J, basically. Those are two river uh, tide gates that we did a recent study on that's actually just been pressed now with the uh, Northeastern, Northeastern Naturalist. Um, and we've got uh, basically two kinds of, of tide gates. So we have you can see here in this uh, this figure, you have uh, A and E. This is a, a periodically submerged tide gate. It's a massive structure. It's about 20 feet uh, high from the, the low tide mark up to the top of that concrete there. I, I know there's not a scale there. Um, and this uh, was recently uh, installed on the La Palms River, uh, which runs through the town of Amherst in Nova Scotia. And uh, you can tell there that it's missing some of its uh, hard form. We're going to talk about that. You can see one of the tide gate doors is, uh, has been removed. Um, and that was part of, of the study of, uh, that we did for a mitiga mitigation strategy because this tide gate was not passing Gaspro effectively. Um, a lot of these tide gates are deemed fish friendly. 
Uh, you can see that um, 30 by 30 centimeter hole through the door there, that flapper door where that E is with the arrow. Um, and that's deemed by, um, you know, blueprints as being a fish friendly uh, option for tide gate designs. <clears throat> we'll talk about that too. So uh, otherwise you have the old style Acadian abato where you uh, put a culvert underneath an earthen berm dike basically and you have a flapper door that's constantly submerged for the most part. Uh, and that's what hap has happened in, for the La Palmas River in the past and currently for the Missaquash River, which is on the border of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. And you can see the Missaquash tide gate there in panel uh, C and D, uh, the upstream inlet there where you can see the pit tagging array and the downstream outlet where you can see people uh, dip netting Gaspro when they're, when they're trying to get through the, uh, the obstruction. So. so what did we find out? Well, you look here at this slide, you can see the, uh, that accordion-like uh, uh, scribble um, lines there, the dark lines, which is basically the constant line. That's the tide cycle, if you want to look at it. Um, so you can see that it, um, it, it goes anywhere from, from basically uh, zero to 14 meters, so, uh, which, is, which is about right um, for Hopewell Rocks, which is the tide station data we're using for this. Um, <clears throat> And you can, you can see that uh, all these dots that you see are exactly when the fish were detected uh, upstream or at the tide gate itself. So the first panel A there is the La Palmas tide gate, uh, the, the new one in 2016 when it first started operating. And you can see that the fish are passing during a very limited window of opportunity. It's basically during the flooding, daily flooding tide. And it's uh, anywhere from 10 to 20 minute opportunity. Uh, for fish to find that door when it's uh, still open before the tide literally rises and pushes the door shut. So they have that narrow uh, opportunity for passage, mid-flood tide. And you can see it's happening during the, the neap tides. And there's no passage happening at all during low tide, which is ironic considering that's when the door is constantly open. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, a concern. You can also see here that it's not just a daily tidal influence for uh, for anadromous fish or for you know I and I can vouch for this for for um, salmon is as well. So there is a there is a a, a reason of um, a behavioral uh, pattern that anadromous fish follow, and that's they they generally come in at neap tides and they also ride the flooding tide. A lot of people think they queue to to fresh water when they're coming in from the estuary and and queue in that that down flow from fresh water, and that's how they they, um, you know, get to start the run, but it's actually, they, they surf the tide in. Um, and this has been shown by other studies, uh, acoustic tracking for on sea run brook trout, for example, and an Arctic char, which is a study I did up in the Arctic and uh, Nunavut. So uh, this happens in macrotidal estuaries where fish will literally save energy by surfing the tidal wave as it's flooding in. And so this happens and they tend to choose, as you can tell, the neap tides, not these spring tides, so the big tides, they avoid them. You can see that there's not a lot of passage during spring tides, but it's happening mostly during neap for both tide gates. Okay, so the, the A is the La Plange, the periodically submerged one, and the constantly submerged one, the old style is B and C on the Missaquash River. <clears throat> you can see, sorry, on the, the top level panel there, there's no passage during low tide from La Plange tide gate. Um, <clears throat> but that dotted line that's vertically uh, at the end there around the 18th, 19th of May in 2016. Uh, basically that's when the door was taken off that structure as a mitigation um, alternative. So fishermen were basically saying, you know, no fish are getting through. We can't catch anything on the river anymore. Um, so we went to DFO and Department of Agriculture in Nova Scotia and we had a meeting and a couple of days later, they literally popped the door off. And basically when you open the door, the fish go through, no problem, there was no delay. And you can see that all of a sudden there's this bunch of these dots um, being detected going through that uh, structure. And it was a, lar a much larger window of opportunity. However, it was still happening during the mid flood to high tide and even the ebb uh, tide as well. So, but not, never during the low tide when the water was running out through the structure. <clears throat> the uh, other two, the other two panels there, B and C, are the Missaquash, the old style abato that's constantly submerged, and you can see <clears throat> that passage is actually during mo all tide phases, even low tide, no problem. Um, most of it was happening during uh, ebb and low, so the fish were queuing in on the water flowing when the door was open, uh, flowing out from upstream. <clears throat> 
Um, however, they're even managing to pass the structure during a uh, high tide when the door was should be closed. But due to sedimentation or maybe a faulty door, perhaps, or a, or a debris, the door was still slightly open enough for fish to find and uh, to negotiate that tide gate, even during high tides. So it was provided a, a greater window of opportunity uh, in both years, 2016 and 2017, compared to the new uh, periodically submerged tide gate on the Little Palm system. So <laughs> you can see it down here in this, uh, this figure, there's a, literally the excavator lifting the door out. Uh, that new tide gate, and it also gives you an idea of scale, how massive the structure is. Um, <clears throat> when this study started, we, uh, we were already tracking fish for two to like three years um, in the, that area and on the Palms River. Um, this, the new tide gate uh, started working in 2016, like I said. So in 2015, they were still using the old style, constantly submerged uh, tide gate like the Missaquash River. And as you can see the 2015 data set, it shows that rivers, the spawning run, uh, the timing of fish, the returning fish that were already tagged was synchronous. So there was no delay or, or both gates were basically delaying fish for the relative same amount of time. Um, but in 2016, you can see that the um, Missaquash River, the fish were getting up, you know, following that pattern, the cumulative returning return function there. And you can see that it doesn't start until later on the Missico on the La Plange River, sorry, with this new gate. And then when you see that arrow, that's when the door was taken off in 2016 and 2017 and 2018 and 19. And you can see all of a sudden that there's this massive pulse of fish basically barreling through once the door is removed and the obstacles, uh, the barrier is removed and, they, and then it resynchronizes basically with the, uh, with the Missiquash River. Now both these rivers say, share the same river mouth where it empties into Cumberland Basin. So basically they should have the same uh, run timing, uh, really just two tributaries of, of a once, you know, a river that extended further out into the Bay of Fundy a long time ago. So, um, <clears throat> and you can see that uh, in 2018, the timing run was actually synchronous and that taking the door off really didn't uh, resynchronize anything. It actually, the timing was right on, even when the door timing was, was earlier than previous years or around the same, same time as in 2017, but in 2016 was much uh, later and during the spawning run. And then 2019, there was also that delay again happening and then popping the door off seems to resynchronize the runs again. So, so this mitigation uh, option seems to be an effective, uh, albeit temporary uh, measure for um, making, ensuring that fish are passing this, this new structure. Uh, the door is put back on at the end of the gas row spawning run in, uh, in July, once every, all the fish return to sea after spawning. So, so now we're moving upstream. Let's say you pass the tide gate uh, and now you're going to hit uh, some low uh, overhead, um, small scale fishways, which are part of uh, Ducks Unlimited Canada's um, dikes and uh, dam systems that uh, basically and build wetlands and impoundments. Uh, and they uh, they install fish passage on on these uh, these these dikes or, or these dams. So we have three structures that we're looking at here. You can see how they're just coming up on the screen. You have. Uh, the blue one and the yellow one are both Daniel style um, fishways. These are basically just concrete channels and they have uh, plywood pieces with notches cut in them. You can see it there in that photograph and, and the notches and the plywood pieces basically slow the water down enough that the fish can have a basically a lower velocity slope ramp um, to, uh, to basically navigate uh, up the, that rise in the river and past the dam. <clears throat> um, the uh, other one I'll show you later, the F is a pool and weir. So that's probably one that a lot of people are familiar with as well. And it's just a series of pools with notches between them that the fish basically jump from one pool to the next to get up that rise in elevation. So uh, fishway tracking, we're still using RFID and the antennas on these fishways were situated uh, too near the, the entrance, the downstream uh, outlet basically, like you see them here is labeled as one and two. And then during the upstream inlet, uh, they're labeled as three and four. So basically a fish that was tagged and is successful would be detected at basically, you hope if everything's firing and working properly, one, two, three, four. So that's the, a space, a fish that successfully ascended the fishway. An unsuccessful fish would be one that basically hit antenna, say one and two or three, uh, and then was detected going three, two, one, and then maybe trying again, one, two, three, and three, two, one, or one, two, two, one, and et cetera. Uh, and but basically just failed to get to antenna four and uh, and then not detected for a, a specific period of time, which would be what being successful. So those unsuccessful fish 
uh, can make multiple attempts. They just basically give up after uh, so many attempts um, or or they're predated upon or dip net at the entrance of the fish way, depending on the situation. Um, <clears throat> undetected fish are just simply fish that we've tagged that year and uh, they're not detected at all by any antenna. So they just abandon the run. Maybe it's too much for them. The whole alien abduction with the tagging procedure uh, or they're predated upon or, or there are countless reasons. Um, but they don't all uh, just disappear because some undetected fish during the year of tagging show up the next year and the next year. So sometimes they might just abandon run or switch to a river that we weren't monitoring uh, and then return in years uh, uh, following that. So all this is published for the fishway tracking uh, back in 2017. And what we're trying to basically show is is uh, how well are they working? Because everyone wants to know percentages and numbers. And when it comes to, uh, you know, how do fish perform in a certain style or type or uh, designed fish way, uh, it's really case by case. And, uh, and, but you have to look at the numbers if you want to compare in a certain way. You can't just tag a bunch of fish, throw them into the bottom of the structure and say, oh, we tagged 105, made it through. So that's 5% passage. That's not the way it works. Uh, you tag a bunch of fish below the structure and then you have to wait to see who actually shows up at the structure who wants to play the game. Uh, you know, you can dress a bunch of players in the hockey rink and put them on the bench, but if they never get on the ice, how are they ever supposed to score, right? So basically, it's the same thing with tagging. You can dress a bunch of fish, tag them all, um, and put them on the bench, basically throw them back in the river. But if they don't get to the fish way, in other words, and want, uh, you put them on the ice, there's no way they're ever going to have a chance to actually pass it. Or, or in this case, score if they're on ice. So that's what I always tell people. It's sort of like dressing people for the game, but you gotta put them on the ice. So here we go. So out of the fish that we've tagged and all these structures, <clears throat> most of them will find the entrance to the fish way. It's not really about attraction. So 55% to 100% um, that we know are in the area, because we have uh, arrays below the structures, like within 100 meters of the structures, will actually be detected at the fishway. So we know who shows up in the area, and then we know who finds the fishway. Anywhere from 55 to 100 percent. You might say, well, that's not that great. However, you have to also take into consideration that this could be um, a gear functioning, whether it's properly on or off. You saw in the last talk that pit arrays don't always work full time. Um, for various reasons, either a blowout event or a flooding event, or, or the batteries run dead, a whole whack of reasons, uh, or a beaver chews through your wire instead of a squirrel. Um, I was laughing at that. I thought that was great. Um, but it can also be simply people catching the fish at the fishway entrance with the dip net because they're poaching illegally, and uh, that removes your tags. And so the, that affects your attraction uh, percentage rates, so the fishway entrance. So uh, once they show up the fishway, then you have your number. Um, how many get through. So this is the passage rate or your passage efficiency. And you can see here that for these different style fishways, the two Deniels, La Paz, Mishquash, and the La Coupe, the Pullman Weir, uh, which is in the lower right-hand corner, if you want to see the different pools, and then it's also the structure in the lower uh, upper left-hand corner. Um, <clears throat> the passage rates vary year to year. However, they were so fairly consistent as well. If you take uh, this over time, it's a multi-year study. Anywhere from, you know, 0.5% passage rate to uh, 97%, which is really amazing if you think about it, or 98, sorry. Uh, well, Plange was pretty consistent. Uh, the Missaquash structure was fairly consistent, but not as, uh, good, as, not as good as functioning, uh, you would say, as uh, the La Plange, comparatively speaking. So it was replaced on 29, uh, the, <clears throat> sorry, 2018 in the summer, and then it was the first year that it was monitored in 2019. We still haven't got the 2021 data for that yet, um, but it's still not too bad if you want to look at a number as far as passage rates, anywhere from 64 to 81 percent. Uh, the Le Coupe and Weir Fishway, uh, the first year we monitored, uh, we tagged, I think, 200 fish and one made it up. So that's that 0.5 percent uh, that showed up and were detected. That's pretty poor, um, <clears throat> as you can imagine, but the plunge pool below the structure was basically graveled in. Uh, the next year in 2014, literally people went out with shovels and shoveled the gravel out of the plunge pool. So the fish literally had a, an approach to the uh, fishway and then 25% passed. And then uh, the structure was basically taken out and a new structure was built, which is what you see in the photographs there in the upper left. Um, and since then, it's been functioning relatively uh, consistently, anywhere from 60 to uh, 75%. There's a 23% passage rate in there. 
with an exclamation mark and the exclamation mark means that beavers chewed through the electrical wires on antenna four and so we didn't get the uh, the right passage rates uh, as you normally would when you're analyzing the data so lovely um you know rodents they're great what can we say um so moving on to other obstructions let's say you negotiated uh, the tide gate, you negotiate the fishways, and then you're uh, going up and you're like, yeah, I made it, I'm going to get to the spawning ground, Yeehaw. Uh Maybe not, because as we know, there are thousands and thousands of roads and thousands and thousands of culverts underneath those roads, anywhere and everywhere in the world, who's kidding who? And so we have a perch culvert on one of the tributaries of the Tantramar River, and we it's a known uh, fish obstruction and uh, obstacle and a problem because they've actually installed a, uh, a steel sluice uh, gear ramp on it. Uh, you can see that kind of laminar flow in the middle of the, uh, the water cascading over this culvert there. You can see how, how much that perched elevation really is. Um, Rochelle Barreau is about 5'5", five, five if you want to scale, she's standing right beside it there. So it's an easy, um, you know, 40, 50, 40 centimeter jump into the culvert. Uh, completely laminar flow of, to get through this. Um, <clears throat> and so that uh, that ramp um, is also a laminar flow. It's, and uh, so we we basically tagged a bunch of fish. And um, out of the 291 fish that were tagged below this culvert, that's where they were caught as well. 176 attempted it, um, which would lead to a 60% traction rate, which is pretty easy because, of course, there's nowhere else to go. So, of course, they're going to find it. Uh, and then it says below of 179 attempting 36 pass, which is a 20% passage rate. Um, you might be looking at it going, wait a second here. Uh, you said 176 attempted. Uh, and then you say below 179 attempted. Well, where'd the extra three come from? Well, uh, the extra three are from other uh, rivers nearby because all these rivers we studied were within six kilometers of each other, basically. So fish were straying over to this system and trying to navigate the culvert as well. Uh, regardless, uh, it doesn't matter who was trying and where they were tagged, only 20% were passing of, the, of those that were attempting. And delay was significant, whether they passed or not. So trying to negotiate this perch culvert was anywhere as far as uh, from date of tagging um, to when they actually passed the structure or didn't or just gave up and we never detected them again that year. It was anywhere from 11 to 17 days, which is pretty significant when most uh, Gasparo are only uh, in the spawning run for anywhere from uh, usually about 20, 20 to 30 days. So so that's a significant chunk of, of their spawning run period. So out of a month, basically half of it is you're stuck at a culvert trying to get through, or a third of the time you're trying to negotiate a culvert. And that's just one obstacle out of the tide gates, which is also on this uh, river system. So, all right, now moving on to other things we kind of um, gained from this study. Maybe not so much with passage obstructions. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this, but salmon are a part of this paradigm as well. So when anadromous fish are spawning, it's uh, always been thought, well, they they fast, they don't eat. Uh, the same belief was held with uh, Gaspar or alewife. However, we sampled a lake uh, in the system during the spawning run of spawning aged adults. We were gillnetting them, and then we did stomach content analysis, and we found that of the of 93 percent of the fish that we caught. Uh, had food in their stomachs and they were actively feeding on calanoid copepods and uh, mayfly nymphs depending on the hatch. Um, so much so that the empty stomachs weren't even that prevalent. Only three to 17 percent of males had empty stomachs and females only had empty stomachs when they were actively spawning because we also uh, associated all this with gonosomatic indices. So uh, it was a, a really kind of neat discovery and the first time that this has been documented where fish are uh, you know, spawning or feeding on spawning grounds, why they're spawning. Another thing that we uh, kind of touched on, uh, this hasn't been published yet, it's been in the literature for, uh, for, for decades, but no one's really looked into it in any great detail, is uh, the male skewed sex ratio. Uh, and this may or may not apply to Atlantic salmon, I'm uncertain. Um, it'd be interesting to look at it. Um, but it's been shown on our river systems that uh, there's more males than females, even though they show up at the tide gates, uh, equal numbers of males and females, a one-to-one -one sex ratio. But the further you go upstream, uh, you get more males and less females. And the question is, well, why? And ecologically speaking, that's kind of a problem because you probably want more females than males because, hey, sperm is cheap and eggs are expensive to produce. So uh, this is an issue, ecologically speaking, and for recruitment purposes. Uh, and if you look at the data out of all the years that we've been tracking, the sex ratio data 
because we, we, we sex the fish when we tag the male or female. And you can see that from early, mid, and late run that, and depending on how far you go up the river system where we're actually tagging fish or have data on the fish, um, you can see that the male-female ratio is changing and it's actually increasing uh, the further you go up stream. So from the tide gates all the way to the spawning lakes, um, the, the sex ratio for males to females can increase even greater than three to one males to female, uh, which is pretty pretty significant uh, for for a ecological and a fish management perspective uh, for anadromous fishes. Um, so we haven't really looked into this um, in great detail yet, but it is out there in the literature. It's been documented. Um, but our theory is, is that basically the more obstructions you have on river systems, the more skewness you get for, for males versus females. And we say this because back in 2017, if you look at the fish tracking, fish weight tracking study, we found that males were more successful than females at passing these obstructions. Basically, and the going theory is that males have more muscle, muscle mass relative to body mass total. Uh, because females are basically carrying eggs and uh, there's a lot more room needed for eggs than there is for carrying a bunch of sperm. So um, so males are basically being more successful at passing any obstruction, whether it's a tide gate or a culvert or a fishway. And this is skewing the sex ratio so that males are showing up in greater numbers than the spawning grounds versus females. And you may say, well, hmm, that's a great hypothesis. Well done. Well, yeah, it is. And we haven't proven anything yet. However, other rivers that have tracked fish um, blueback herring, for example, down in Florida, 100 kilometer long river, but no obstructions, have a one to one sex ratio of males to females in the estuary and a one to one ratio of males to females on the spawning grounds. So, begs the question what's going on? All right. Another thing we've uh, figured out, and this relates to the last talk there with the return rates with Atlantic salmon in the Bay of Fundy and uh, marine survival, because that's the big hot ticket right now with Atlantic salmon. Marine survival, they're, they're, uh, they're leaving, but they're not coming back. Uh, well, what about Gasparo? Because there's a lot of issues going on, it seems, everywhere in these days, especially with the world's oceans. So what about their lifespan? What about their survival and survivorship? Well, our data set uh, with the pit tags have given us a really unique um, ability to, to do some of these questions that no one's been able to answer yet. For example, here's one. Uh, lifespan of a Gasparo. Well, as far as I could find, they lived to be nine years old. Uh, however, last year, we got a returning fish that was tagged in 2014 uh, on one of the rivers that we we're monitoring. So that made it possibly its eighth spawning run, which is pretty impressive for a small Gasparo. Maybe it was a salmon. You'd be like, yeah, okay, cool, but no big deal. But for a Gasparo, hmm, eight times spawning, iteroparity, that's pretty amazing. So... Uh, if you base that on the age of maiden spawners, let's say it was uh, anywhere from three to six years old, which is the range of per age of first spawning for Gasparo. So if it was three years old when it was tagged in 2014, that makes it 10 years old when we uh, detected it last year. And if it was older than that during its first maiden trip spawning, it could be as old as 13, which blows that whole lifespan maximum nine years old out of the water. Pretty cool. All right. Then we get into the other tag data that we've uh, had, and we get an apparent uh, annual survival rates, and we're actually getting fish coming back, uh, 25 to 50 percent of fish that leave come back, um, which is pretty impressive. And it varies, and it varies with river, and it varies year to year, which you would expect. Uh, you can see here in this figure that the lowest uh, apparent annual survival from year to year is really on the Missaquash River versus the La Plange and La Coupe, La Coupe Rivers, and it, it makes absolute sense because the Missaquash River is the only one out of those three rivers that have a very had and has a consistent active fishery commercially at the tide gate uh, every year during the study. Uh, they use gill nets, trap nets, and dip nets. So that would definitely lower your survival of fish getting through the tide gate and being detected on, on the detection arrays upstream of the tide gate. So, I mean, that, so this is not just marine survival when the fish leave, this is also uh, survival from tagging, spawning run, uh, all the way through and coming back out, marine survival, and then going through the estuary again before being detected. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a lot of survival combined into one, but it still gives you an idea of how many fish are actually returning after they've been tagged. Um, <clears throat> we, we can also use this because we, we get consistent uh, data from year to year. It basically drops off, you know, 30% the first year at one year at large. Then it drops to 10%, then it goes to 5%, and it goes to 1%, and less than 1% after five years at large. 
burning it tagged individual that we've done. And we're talking thousands of fish because we tagged 10,000 fish. So this is not a small sample size. This is based on robust numbers. We're talking about thousands of fish uh, in this, uh, this model. And we've done um, mark recapture modeling. It basically shows uh, an extinction, quasi-extinction rate of five years. So if you block off a river for five years, uh, whatever it may be, maybe the tide gate fails or it gets silted in and no one's bothered to monitor it or a uh, fishway sucks because there's no plunge pool. Um, basically in five years time, that population uh, can uh, potentially go extinct with no recruitment that reaching the spawning grounds. So this also, you know, can apply to Atlantic salmon. You block them off. I don't know what it is, but for gastro it's five years. So uh, big, big, uh, you know, management. Um, question mark and like, hmm, I wonder now what? Um, so basically in summary, uh, uh, from the eight years that we've been doing this project, we found out uh, basically what works better uh, for fishways and tide gates. Uh, and no, ducks doesn't operate tide gates, but if, uh, it doesn't matter what you do with a fishway upstream or any obstruction upstream, if the fish can't get in through the estuary, then you gotta, you gotta work with all the obstructions in the river. So we've, we've dabbled in that and worked together with DFO and the Department of Agriculture or whoever's managing these tide gates. And they're ubiquitous. The Bay of Fundy alone has over 50 rivers with tide gates at the head of tide. Um, so, <clears throat> so there's a need for regular monitoring and maintenance of, of any obstruction, whether it be a culvert or a fishway or a tide gate especially when you consider a quasi extinction period of five years, it's not a long time. And let's face it, it's not easy to send people around every year to monitor and maintain these structures, depending on how many you have, uh, you know, within your jurisdiction, whatever you may be, whether you're Department of Agriculture or Ducks Unlimited Canada or CFO or you name it, right? Um, sex, size, and experience matters. If you're a gas bro and probably if you're a salmon too. So if you're bigger, you have more chance to get through an obstruction. If you're sexier, haha. If you're a male versus female, and I don't mean to be sexist, but you have a better chance of getting through. Uh, and experience counts. Returnees seem to do it better than first time taggers. So whether that's a figment of, or a, you know, post-traumatic stress from, uh, from the tagging procedure, and uh, they've all kind of shaken it off after a year and returning, who knows? But it seems that returnees basically just say, ah, I've done this before. And uh, they negotiate it, and there's less delay for returnees, but again, I know if anyone else wants to do a PhD, I've got 2 million data points they can look at, no problem. Um, <clears throat> alewife river switching, multiple and terminal fallback behaviors for Gaspero and salmon too, most likely, can complicate any management policy that you put into play. When it comes into river obstructions, even if the fish gets through it once, it doesn't mean that it's not gonna fall back down through it again and have to negotiate the same obstacle again and again and again during the same spawning run because Gaspero can track doing the exact same thing. And I know for a fact that salmon switch rivers and river tributaries within the same system, uh, even during the same year when they're in there. So just because they spawn in a certain place doesn't mean that they're not falling back and going to a holding pool somewhere else on another tributary and then coming back later to the same spawning area. Um, we've done, I've seen that tracking in St. Mary's River in Nova Scotia. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, it's, uh, it's just a, a really interesting um, spinoff for all of this with the gas bro and how it can be applied to to management of any system whether in whatever species you're managing any any fish with they all move so it doesn't matter whether going upstream or downstream whether an hazardous or not um, they still have to negotiate these uh, these obstacles and these obstructions uh, whether in the estuary or within the river problem so i'll take any questions now if it's possible and um yeah Thank you very much for your attention and time. And of course, there were countless funding sources uh, for this this project over these uh, these past eight years.